Hello, Trojan fans. Welcome to another edition of the Peristyle Podcast slash Tunnel Vision. I don't know. These kind of the shows get kind of mixed together, but we're not going to do a big intro today because we have a very special guest. Uh, we're doing this live on YouTube. We're recording this on different podcasting platforms, and we have USC quarterback Miller Moss joining us here from the Academic Center over on campus here on a Wednesday evening. Miller, thanks so much for uh, coming on. Yes, sir. Thank you for having me. Yes, sir. Wow. I thought, yeah. My intro, Connor, wasn't very good. I was like, uh, <laughs> late, I usually do the intro morning, like late the day one. I can usually get the hello out. Really, I was like, it wasn't working. I just sometimes I could just go, but it wasn't very good. So no, like, no, it was good. It was yeah, good. That, that was fine. We got to change the. We have to update our intro too. Now Miller does have a highlight in the intro there because um, those are, I think, the only highlights we had from the first two games last season. So uh, we can we got to change that up. Uh, get some holiday ball highlights in there. So yeah. we can talk about that. Uh, but we want to thank uh, House of Victory uh, for making this possible. We were doing a bunch of these interviews uh, last season. It was great. Get some players on. Get some, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one time uh, a little bit. Kind of get to know a little bit more about them than maybe like the five minutes after practice. So this was set up through House of Victory. So I just want to let everyone know about that. Some really exciting stuff going on uh, over at House of Victory. And I'll put up a promo code if you want to check that out. You can scan that promo code and you can donate to House of Victory we're going to get into more of some of that stuff that's exciting going on uh, with House of Victory, but definitely want to give them a shout out and thank them. And uh, as always, we're going to thank Trader Joe's. We're going to see if Miller is a big Trader Joe's fan because you got the one over on campus, right? Do you go over there a bunch? Yeah, of course. You got to go. Of course. That's where I get my cereal at. Oh, you got your cereal at? Nice. Uh, I went, so I went the other day. So Chris Javino was doing, we've been working a lot because you had a big recruiting weekend at USC. Uh, the women's basketball team was over there going, you know, going to the Sweet 16. Chris was in here doing like a four-hour podcast, but him and his his real girlfriend, Kristen, came over to my house and I made them dinner from Trader Joe's. I, I did uh, chicken thighs and um, asparagus, not asparagus, I did uh, a Brussels sprouts and, uh, no, I'm sorry, it wasn't Brussels, it was broccoli. I'm going to get together, three, right? Three different greens, but it was broccoli, <laughs> uh, florets, broccoli florets, and uh, baby red potatoes. And I did it all in the air fryer, seasoned it up. So good. And then we had a little, we had some wine from Trader Joe's. So oh, that was good. There we go. Uh, you 21 yet? That's over Miller. my head. But I, I am. That, all that cooking is over my head. <laughs> I'm it's sure good it was stuff. delicious. You can get the, <laughs> yeah, you can get the frozen go. stuff and, you know, heat that up too. But want to thank Trader Joe's as well. And we uh, thank you, Miller. What, so what's been going on? Are you, you doing all right? I mean, it's kind of crazy time since December holiday bowl to now. It's got to be pretty nutty for you. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it's definitely been a little a little crazier, but um, definitely excited for this opportunity just in the middle of spring right now. So really focused on the team and, and what we got to do to continue to climb. Let's talk about spring for a second, Miller. So you've been in spring camp with Caleb Williams and Lincoln Riley before when Caleb was clearly that number one quarterback going into the season. Now, even right. though Lincoln Riley hasn't said it, it feels like you'll be the guy. How is spring different from you for you right now? as the QB1, likely to be uh, the QB1 this season, and just take me through the differences from this year in spring ball compared to the last couple for you. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a, a difference, you know. I mean, like, you, you try to say, like, you approach practice the same way and you're always prepared, and I think that's absolutely true to a certain extent. Like, I, I try to have as detailed a preparation as always, um, same way I did when Caleb was here. But um, I think with Caleb being here the previous two years, like, it allowed me to focus more on my game and detail what I had to work on and not as much the entire team and the entire offense. So now I feel much more responsibility, not only to the entire, to the team, but to the offense performance as a whole, which I welcome. And I think it's a really interesting um, growth period for me and something that I've really tried to embrace um, in that role and in, in bringing the offense and, like I said, the team together as a whole. I uh, put some comments up. So if you're watching us live on YouTube, oops, I put the wrong... Uh... I put, that's, I put this, no, I'm getting this, that shot's all screwed up. I wanted me and uh, Miller on one of the shots. Um, I'm putting some comments up on the screen. So if you are watching us live on YouTube, thank you very much for doing that. If you have questions and stuff, we'll try to get to them. But I'll put those up uh, on the screen as they come through. Uh, Miller, I did want to talk about the Holiday Bowl real quick. I mean, that, one of the things we've seen Caleb Williams kind of go through the draft process. And we've done a lot of interviews, you know, people asking about him and stuff. And I was like, well, if you want to know, like, who was the most excited in that stadium for Miller Moss throwing six touchdown passes? It might have been Caleb Woods. I think that's that was one way you could explain it. Is that true? And what was that kind of like having him there supporting you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like, I think 
typically like in the the environment that inhabits college football now, like a lot of people like to pit players, specifically quarterbacks, in the same room against one another. And I think the the case was like it couldn't have been more opposite with Caleb and I. And obviously, like it was frustrating for me to not not play and not be out there, but that never took away from our relationship. And I think we both understand understood that the stronger our relationship and the stronger our bond was, the more likely we were to to have success on offense. So. Um, we worked really, really well together. I'd like to think that I pushed him. I know he certainly pushed me a ton. So um, obviously really, really happy for him and everything that he's about to go through. But um, without a doubt, someone I'll be, I'll be friends with and grateful for for a very long time. And real quick on that follow-up, I just – when I – the notes I took during – I ended up getting COVID. I couldn't go to the Hollywood Bowl. So that was the one game I missed this year. But, you know, sometimes <laughs> as a quarterback, like – you throw a little dump off and it goes for 50 yards and a touchdown. And you're like, all right. Or you throw like a 50 yard bomb in the end zone. The guy drops it. You don't get a touchdown. I think five right. of your six passes went into the end zone. I mean, it seemed like when you were throwing touchdown, you threw six in that game, but like, I mean, these were legit touchdown passes. I, did it seem like that to you? You guys were throwing bombs into the end zone. Yeah. I mean, like I, I'm not necessarily conscious of that at, at the time. Obviously, <laughs> like, I can go back and, and think about like, yeah, we were throwing the ball in the end zone. But um, I think for me, I was really just trying to make the next right decision based on the look we were given and the call we were in. So I wasn't, there was no conscious effort of, oh, I need to show this or show that. I think I just wanted to, to run the call that Coach Riley said. Obviously, I felt very prepared and have a ton of faith in the call that's coming from the sideline um, from Coach Riley. So I think it, it wasn't anything where I was like, oh, I need to throw the ball in the end zone. It was just continue to make the next right decision. That's interesting to hear you say that, Miller, because I'm curious about it only had a couple runs in the game, but did you purposely want to run the ball in the Holiday Bowl to show defenses that they need to be honest and respect your running ability in this game? Was that a thought on your mind? At all? I'm sure in the moment, maybe not, but is that something you try to do in the game to keep defenses honest in the future? No, not at all. Honestly, I, I hope that they continue to not respect it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but no, I mean, kind of like I said previously, like if I, if I get a chasing the end, um, I'm going to pull the ball. And I think that's, that's just the right decision given that run scheme. So there was no conscious effort to, to move around. I tried to just do what, what was needed for me, um, as the, as the offense, uh, dictated. So there wasn't any conscious effort to do so, but if I have to run, I'm, I'm more than willing to. I remember in the off season, two years ago, you talked about wanting to improve, your running ability, and I, I think you've done that. How has your life changed just in general since the Holiday Bowl? I mean, superficially, it's changed a lot. I don't think, like, a lot of that stuff is rooted in substance and stuff that, that truly matters at the end of the day. Um, I mean, if, if your story can help inspire younger kids and can make people happy watching you play and stuff like that, then that's absolutely a positive. But at the end of the day, like, we're focused on winning games. Um, it doesn't matter how many people – recognize you or don't recognize you or whatever it may be like all that stuff's good and nice but then the day like we're we're focused on on what we need to do to win games so my my head and and heart are, are in this facility maybe less in the academic center where i'm at right now more <laughs> in the up, upstairs offices with the with the film room but um but uh, we're definitely focused on on winning games and not so much on on the other stuff um i want to mention some of the other stuff real quick because i you know we House of Victory is uh, helping us do this uh, interview, so we, we appreciate them doing that. I, I want to talk about the kind of some of the work that you did or ask you about uh, some of the charitable work or anything that was kind of rewarding for you that you've kind of worked through. You got to, you know, reach out to the community through House of Victory. Yeah, absolutely. I think they, they do an excellent job putting us players in situations. Obviously, we're in a huge city, so there's, there's a ton of opportunity um, to get involved with the community. And obviously, me being from L.A., any opportunity I have to – give back to the city, um, given my platform and situation, I, I'd love to. We've done work, the Boys and Girls Club, as well as the Children's Hospital for LA, um, which has been obviously really gratifying and also makes you feel extremely grateful for the opportunities that you've been given. So it's both humbling and gratifying and it's just a unique opportunity that I don't think you get at a lot of other places. Yeah, certainly that's awesome to hear as well. And it just seems like every day we're getting a rule change or a new development What's it been like just overall to be in this era of, of NIL and even the transfer portal to some extent? What, With those two things in mind, what, what has your college experience been like? It's a lot different than what it used to be for a lot of guys. 
Yeah, um, it's definitely different. I think the the biggest hurdle is just having continuity within your team, and I think we've we've done a, a good job focusing on that this off season. Um, I think it's just really difficult with just an ever changing landscape to have a team that's focused on on the team and not individuality. So that's one thing that that we've really tried to harp on this off season, coming together as a team. And I think that we have people that are team centric in leadership positions, and that'll really help us going forward. So that's been the biggest hurdle. I mean, obviously, I think it'll continue to change as we go. Um, we'll probably look back on this time in college football and be like, "Wow, that that was crazy. That really happened." But, um, yeah. But, um, just trying to trying to really build a, a team centric culture and not not play into the individuality individuality that the transfer portal and NIL and stuff like that can create. I mean, when I I've talked to people just you know recently, and you're like thinking about four years ago how different the world was, how different life was. I think I came out to an event that you were throwing with your quarterback coach. I think Bryce Young was throwing there, and maybe. Was it Ty? I think it was Tyler. Yeah. Tyler. Tyler. Yeah. Um, And you guys were throwing, but it was sort of like, I think we had to wear a mask. It was kind of a weird, it was like definitely one of that weird times. And um, there was another, like another one of the camps that like you were at, like how just even from the recruiting process, then that's all changed, you know, the NIL opportunities, you know, I know you guys get to do that kind of stuff. I mean, it, it just seemed like a whole different world from when you were like being recruited to USC to where you are now. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's an excellent point. I mean, the world as a whole has <laughs> definitely changed a lot also. Um, if you would have ever told me that my senior season would be canceled because of a disease that we couldn't go outside, like, I, it's just something that you see in a movie. It's something, like, you would never expect that. But, um, but yeah, um, a lot of radical change in, in all areas, like you said, and especially in the recruiting process. I mean, I didn't get to take an official visit because of COVID, and now you get unlimited official visits. So um, a lot of stuff changed, and I'm sure a lot of stuff will continue to change. But like I said, like the 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 struggle in facing that is trying to build a team that, that, is, that really plays for each other and cares about each other and doesn't care about how much money X, Y, and Z school is going to give them. Miller, let's get back into – spring practice does it feel like you're involved in a quarterback battle right now take me through just the quarterback competition and whether you feel like it is a competition right now yeah i mean i uh <laughs> i try not to to go in to to every practice thinking if i'm in a quarterback competition or not i think my my job is to to put us in a position to, to win games and help this offense become the best offense in the country so that's really what i'm focused on and, and leading my guys um, to the best of my ability. So I think we're doing a good job of that. Obviously, still a lot of ground to make up, but that's really where my focus is at. We have a comment. We actually got a super chat. So let me do the little uh, Alex. Um, do you like the super chat thing? You got to do your own show, Miller. He says, uh, Miller makes all the players around him better. <laughs> um, th- thank you so much for the super chat, Alex. And I think you're right about Miller, but I, you can donate the House of Victory for this one. You don't need to do super chats for us. You can uh, put that money... Uh, towards House of Victory and help the team. Uh, but thank you for doing that. And uh, But that's a good compliment from Alex. He thinks you make the, the guys around you better. Yeah, definitely. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I appreciate Thank you very much. <laughs> um, I think that's... Like, no, I don't. Yeah, yeah, there's... <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that's that's what I strive for each and every day. So obviously still have a lot of a lot of work to do in terms of understanding each and every guy and how to get the best out of them but that's also always always something you're striving for in my position it seems like the goal of the offseason has been to bulk up have you bulked up and does your arm strength feel any different with a few months of the new strength and conditioning regimen under your belt yeah definitely i don't think i've I've gained a lot of weight per se but i've i've lost fat and gained muscle so um like the the difference in pounds isn't drastic but the difference in body composition is more drastic so obviously happy about that want to continue to build on that um i didn't gain 40 pounds like some of the d linemen yeah. <laughs> um but yeah i think my my arm feels stronger i feel good i think that's largely a byproduct of of training but um not so much like muscle like the amount of muscle you have i think like if you want to throw further you have to train throwing tr- train throwing farther um I think it's just like a skill-based position, but definitely feel good, excited about where the team's at, and obviously we're going to have a very important summer window to continue to build on the work we did in the winter. It feels 
different. You've been around the program for a few years now. Like this spring, I don't know how, how different it feels from last year. I mean, you, obviously, like the kind of some of the leadership isn't there. There's new leadership. But just, I don't know, maybe the morale on the defensive side, it seems like people are really excited. Maybe that's a two-edged sword for you where it's like, oh, the defense is bigger and stronger and faster. It's like, oh, crap, I got to go against them in the – but does it feel kind of different from before with the new coaches and just like, I guess it seems like a different attitude on the defensive side. Yeah, absolutely. And, and to your point, like it, it absolutely makes myself and the offense as a whole better when you go against a very disciplined group. So definitely excited about that. And it makes me elevate my game each and every day because I know there aren't, there's not as many free and free and cheap yards and completions around the field. So I have to be more diligent in my preparation. I think the offense does, a, does as a whole as well. So um, really excited about the defense. I think we have some some great guys that came in. We talk about uh, Easton and uh, Akili, and I'm sure there's a bunch of them leaving out. And we have previous leadership that's been here and guys like Jalen Smith and Eric Gentry and uh, Bear Alexander. So definitely a lot of guys that, that we're excited about. Um, want to see some of the new guys even more throughout spring and kind of see where we're at. But it's definitely going to be a good group, and we're excited. Miller, what's the area you feel like you're teaching your new and younger teammates the most since you have two years of experience in the offense? Yeah, I mean, obviously, like, I, I know the playbook fairly well. <laughs> I would hope so at this point. Um, but I think the biggest thing that I can that I can try to teach them and impart to them is the attitude that comes with playing offense at USC, especially um, as a skill position player. Um, part of the reason that we didn't have the success we should have last year, I felt like, is we we got selfish at those positions. And we need guys that are going to be team first and understand that the ball will come to them if they keep doing the right thing. So um, that's that's the biggest message I can kind of impart to the new guys. And just to just stay in the film room, stay in the weight room, um, and stay focused on the mission. Like you said, like in the, in the changing landscape, it's so easy to get – distracted by things that do not matter at all. So just stay focused on what we have to do as a team and things will work out in the correct way. Miller, we had a question in the chat of YouTube, only natties. Uh, question for Miller, when you talk building team culture, does that also have to do with Riley now prioritizing the defense equal to his offense? Yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of it's kind of two separate venues, right? So. Um, when you talk about scheme, Coach Riley's obviously Coach Ewer is now the quarterback coach, so Coach Riley has the latitude to be involved in a multitude of different things from the O-line room to the receiver room to the defensive installs, um, which is great for him as a head coach. And I think it's something that he's wanted to do for a while and we ended up pulling the trigger on, obviously. So I think he's really excited about that. And then I think from a team culture building standpoint, Coach Riley is absolutely involved in that as well. Um, and I think... I guess to your point, like his ability to be widely involved in the team definitely definitely helps and definitely helps players get around him more and understand his vision more because having him in the quarterback room, I absolutely understand how Coach Riley views preparation for games um, and his attitude towards the game and different opponents and stuff like that. So I think his ability to now um, communicate, to the rest, communicate that to the rest of the team will absolutely help our culture. Miller, what's the difference between a quarterback position meeting led by Luke Heward and one led by Lincoln Riley? And now that Riley isn't working with the quarterbacks as much, how often is he in those meetings? Yeah, so he's he's in there every day, um, and he'll hit on stuff that he feels is is necessary, and then Coach Heward will kind of take it from there. Um, and I think they've they've done a really good job in making that transition feel seamless. Um, they they kind of communicate the same points to us throughout the throughout like scheme and stuff like that. So um, I think they've they've tried to make that transition seamless. They've done a really good job of it. But uh, Coach Heard's a really good guy. Obviously, he's been in the system for the last two years. It's unique to hear his perspective just because he's been coaching receivers. So we get a really, really good look into what they're being coached, which you don't always get. So that's been a unique perspective, and it's been awesome to work with Coach Heard. I know it's still early in spring practice, but you've had some padded practices. I believe you've done some 11-on-11 11 11 work. I'd be surprised if you hadn't. What have been some of your takeaways from the offense based on the padded practices and the 11-v-11 11 11 stuff you've done so far? Yeah, I mean, obviously some some really good moments and some things that we we have to improve upon. I think the biggest thing for this window right now for us as an offense and the team as a whole, but specifically as an offense, is developing an attitude. Um, and I think at times we've done a really good job of 
demonstrating that attitude that we want to have. And at times we've not done that. So obviously there's a, there's a ton of work to be done, but I think we've flashed kind of what we want to be. And those are good things to, to build on. And then obviously the, on the other side, there's good things to learn from. So um, really want to continue to establish that attitude that, that we want to play with. Going to try to get you to name some names here. Which transfers have impressed you the most so far and why? If you could give names and sentences, that would be great. But I understand sometimes you guys don't want to single people out. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I'm sure I'll leave people out. So um, if I do by accident, <laughs> no uh, no offense meant to anyone, obviously. But um, like I said before, Easton and Akili um, have really stood out on the defensive side. I think Easton's leadership and, and overall football knowledge really stands out in the same with Akili. Um on the offensive side, oh, on the offensive side, Woody, Woody's done a great job through four practices. Obviously, excited to see him, him in the backfield. I think he brings a, a veteran presence to that to that room that's needed. Obviously, with with three other fairly young guys in there, so excited about those three definitely. And I'm sure I'm leaving out some guys, but um, everyone that's come in has done a good job, kind of adapting and, and embracing what we're trying to do here. We'll keep this train rolling. Same question, but for the early enrollee freshmen, anyone standing out to you so far? Yeah, B. Jack, Brian Jackson, the the young running back, um, came in, really uh, bought into the winter period, um, cut a bunch of weight, looks really great, has really, really natural hands for running back and, and can run the rock as well. So excited about him and, and what he's going to be able to do. We hear a lot, too, about Elijah Newby, the young linebacker. I know he's on the other side of the field a lot of the time compared to what you're doing. Have you had much – interactions with many interactions with him and, and just what have been your takeaways from from his practice style he seems like a, a really good player for the future yeah absolutely it was funny right when you started or right when i stopped talking i was like oh i should have said something about newbie too <laughs> um great kid obviously he kind of established himself throughout that winter workout period um as a guy that's completely bought in um has had some freaky athletic plays so far. Obviously, a, a young kid, a senior in high school, still learning the system. But you see, you see the potential there, and um, really excited for for him going forward. Well, we're getting lots of interesting comments. Uh, you seem to be a fan favorite. There. Uh, <laughs> LP Cap says you're going to be a great coach. Someone else commented you are going to be a CEO someday. Uh, after whatever your football career is over, did, what were your what are your, what are your plans, or, or if you had plans for some? other career outside of uh, sports or, or maybe in football, but not playing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, people have said the, the coaching thing to me before. I'm not sure how I feel about that. So I'll stay away. I'll they stay work away a lot. From... There's a lot of work, it seems. That doesn't bother me as much as okay. I just, I won't get into it, but <laughs> um, we'll stay away from that one for a little bit. But, uh, I don't know. I've always like wanted to be the CEO of my own company. So whoever said that, I appreciate that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There you go. Um, but yeah, um, I don't. I don't want to be limited by whatever I do in the first thirty years of my life, the next seventy. So um, definitely, definitely want to, you know, explore the world and see what I can do to make it a better place and see what exciting things I can get into afterwards. But um, right now, focus on football. <laughs> That's a great way to look at. It. I like it that you know, because I mean, as an athlete, I think a lot of times people look at like, okay, I'm going to make the professional level, make money, but you're probably most people, I mean, by 30, you're done, right? I mean, there's other, you know, there's the Tom Brady's of the world, but there's a lot of times your professional athletic career ends when you're 30 or early 30s and you still have, you know, 60, 70 years left. So it's a good, like, you got to think about that part too. No, absolutely. Yeah. Miller, I'm curious to hear your perspective on this. So being from Southern California and being the USC quarterback, you think of Matt Leinart, Mark Sanchez, Sam Darnold. What does it mean to you to be a part of that group? It just seems like when the quarterback at USC is from Southern California, it, it means a lot to fans. And in the era of the transfer portal, also, you were a guy who was recruited out of high school, been in the program a long time. You're, you're, you're really a fan favorite. So uh, two-part question, what does it mean to be a fan favorite and what does it mean to be a SoCal quarterback representing USC? Yeah, um, I mean, when it comes to a, to a fan favorite, I can't control that very much but obviously very grateful for you know the the trojan family as we we like to refer to it but um i think when you when you talk about the trojan family it obviously includes the the coaching staff and the players here but also the school and student body as a whole and then the fans as well so i've really felt an outpour of support from 
from all of those groups previously mentioned and couldn't be more grateful for, for the support for them from them. Um, and yeah, I, I, I love being a, being a Trojan, being a part of this, this university and obviously this team, um, when it comes to being from SoCal and being mentioned with those, those kind of guys, I think I still have a lot of ground to make up in, in my career when it comes to being mentioned in, in the circle with those names, but, um, obviously an honor. I mean, those are guys I grew up idolizing and looking up to and watching their games and all that kind of stuff. So, um, I think it's more motivating than anything, like being mentioned with those with those guys, um, and also lets me know I've got a got a lot of work to do. So, you mentioned some legends there, Connor, and uh, and Miller, some idols for him. I wanted to mention so the legends of Troy. There is a, an event coming up if you want to meet some of these guys uh, on Monday, April 29th at uh, Balboa, Balboa Bay Resort in Newport Beach. It's the Legends of Troy Gala. It's a signature event for House of Victory. Aforementioned Mark Sanchez, uh, Matt Barkley will be there. Um, Mark McGuire, April Ross, uh, Rodney Pete, Sam Clancy, a whole bunch of uh, USC legends will be there. I know I saw you at one of those events. Uh, I guess it was last year, right? Was it down in Newport Miller? Yeah. You went to one of those. I don't know if you're going to this one, but it's a looks like a pretty big one. So make sure you check it out. You can go to houseofvictory.com and uh, get more information on that. But it's Monday, April 29th, and a lot of the legends of USC will be there. Are you are you going to that one, or can you go to that one, or? I have no idea. It's oh, possible. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. Well, I'm, just, I, I'm just focused on practice tomorrow. <laughs> right. That's true. You got uh, no early. Yeah. What was the 530 a.m. practice like? Was that kind of that was weird for us? I don't know if it was weird for you. It was great. I mean, obviously, like when that 4 a.m. alarm goes off, you're like, <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, once it once you're up, you're good. And I think it's it's good for us just in that we're going to have those noon kickoff games in the either central time or east coast so we're gonna have to play some games on that schedule so obviously good for us to to get used to waking up and going and hitting the field running yeah. at a not so comfortable time <laughs> that makes me think about how disciplined you and the team is but you especially miller you did undergrad in two years right how the heck did you do that yeah um it's kind of an interesting story so i i finished high school in three years and then was able to take some junior college classes the first semester of my senior year along with my religion requirement for alimony and then cal like ap calculus or whatever it was and then enrolled early my senior year and then took a full course load there so by the time i was entering the summer before my freshman year i had essentially done an, an entire year and then I, I doubled up on summer school both years before graduation so i ended up taking four classes each summer um and then took a heavy course load obviously during the the regular school um semesters and, and days so all that kind of piled together let me let me graduate pretty early amazing uh heading into the big 10 what does it mean to you to represent usc first season in a new conference and i know you're just focused on practice tomorrow but that first big 10 game being at michigan in the big house have you, have you thought about that at all and what that experience will be like yeah, absolutely. Obviously, Michigan was a place I, I looked at in recruiting, so I've been there before and seen that stadium and, and can't wait. You know, road road conference games are, are gold when you're trying to chase a conference title. So um, obviously a really important game for us and looking forward to, to seeing what our team's made of in an environment like that. Do you guys talk about the move to the Big Ten at all? Is that like when you're lifting weights, like, oh, you got to do that last set because we're going to the Big Ten. D d does that come up at all or not really? <laughs> Um, I mean, I think you should do that last set because it's the best thing for you. Fair but, <laughs> um, um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely a motivating factor. I think, obviously, we've we've taken a little heat for not being physical enough, and I think that doesn't go unnoticed. But um, I mean, we're gonna we're gonna train hard and and physical and and get the most out of our our training program with with Coach Wiley because it's the right thing to do, not because of any any conference or any opponent we're playing. So. Regardless who's on the schedule, we're gonna we're gonna get after it because that's that's what's necessary to win games. You've been around USC a lot, and you know, just being on the team the last few years, was it weird seeing that 2024 schedule come out? And there's oh Michigan, and like there's there's no there's Wisconsin, there's not Washington State. I mean, for fans, right. I think it's weird. I don't know for you guys if it it was it like hits you like oh my god, like maybe if you weren't, but you've known this team for a long time. It's it's got to be weird for you. Yeah, definitely. I think it's it's obviously different, but it's uh, definitely exciting as well. Um, we still got Washington, so that's a somewhat familiar. There you go. Yeah. 
Um, but I mean, for me, like growing up watching SC play those those Rose Bowl games, and I think they had a, a series with Ohio State um, in the mid to late 2000s. So like those are those are. That, I mean, that's that's why you come to USC, right? To play in those kind of games. I think when we're at we were at Notre Dame this year and. That place was was rocking, obviously, and they bring out Joe Montana. I mean, we go to Notre Dame; they're they're going to honor everybody that they that's ever <laughs> come there. Um, and Cliff turns to me and he's like, "This is why you come to USC to play in games and environments like this." And I th- I think that couldn't be more correct. So um, definitely excited. I think the team's equally as excited. Yeah, that you mentioned the those Ohio State. I think it was two thousand nine the Ohio State game, but that's I know we saw your video. Connor and I both watched it with uh, Matt Leinert on the on the Instagram with and you you drafted Joe McKnight like he was in he was a star of that game right so um, yeah I'm getting killed for for that team but I don't know I Matt's you could little, have like Marcus Allen yeah, or something yeah, you know yeah. but that's okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean Woody I and uh, team. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. You're just you know it's good. Um, I mean, you took the Bolitnikoff Award winner, so that's good. You know, he's he's like he's legit. Yeah, but, definitely. But that was funny. But yeah, McKnight was uh, you know played in that game was a big part of it with Matt Barkley and all those guys. No, absolutely. He was he was a baller. People were just, people were underrating him a little bit. I feel you thought, like USC's kind of recruiting. I know you can't talk about like prospects now, but USC recruiting in the South, like back in the day, you know, he was one of those guys. Like Ed Ordron wanted him when he was at Old Miss, and everyone thought that he was going to stay in the South. And Pete Carroll kind of you know snuck him out of there. He was a big you know five star recruit and uh recruiting is different now but like we're seeing some inroads down into uh, sec country so uh getting some big some big names to commit from on there uh, do you get involved in that recruiting stuff much though like when they're hosting do you do you help host visitors and things like that yeah just i mean what obviously whatever's needed for me to, to help the program i'm more than happy to do so um whatever whatever they ask of me and if i can help or provide a good perspective for the recruiter, whatever it may be, show them around campus and other activities, then I can, I can help out. And then nice. I'm more than happy. Are you still doing a lot of meditating Miller? Yeah. Um, I mean, I do obviously before every game and then I try to regularly just throughout the, the off season, just cause I feel like it, I don't know. I just feel better when I do it. It's like, it's like using the cold plunge. Like you just, you don't like see it the the results right there but you just feel better when you do it so and can you explain how you got into that i think your mom introduced you to it right at at a young age and um, i know it's really helped me too so i definitely recommend it as well yeah definitely my mom um i'm trying to think how old i was i was young i'm trying to think i think i was 13 and my sister was nine but we went to uh see a meditation specialist in like san monica area and and introduced us to the practice we did kind of like a three four day intensive um, and then kind of just kept up with the practice from there. So it's been an awesome tool for me just in my life since then. So very grateful for that. Amy, Larry, no, we've taken a lot of time. We let you go here pretty soon. We did have a question from uh, Ben in the chat. How did you find your throwing motion? Was it natural or developed? Um, I mean, I think to an extent, like it was natural, but there's years and years of, of development from that. Like you pick up and, and throw a apple when you're, four or five and your coach is like, Hey, like maybe you can play quarterback. <laughs> and then, um, there's, there's some natural element to it, obviously, but, but I think it's since evolved from years and years of, of training and, and coaching and stuff like that. So, um, yes, there's some natural element. Everyone kind of has their own stroke. Um, but it's, it's based on years and years of, of coaching and development from, from people that I trust and believe in. So. Is it kind of like a golf swing where you can kind of get little tips where like, you know, maybe Lincoln Riley has something to say, or, you, you know, you've had your personal quarterback coach or um, Cliff Kingsbury is like, Hey, try it, you know, put yeah. your finger here. Like, is there little things like that? Like you know, shift your weight, you know, your takeaway for the golf swing. Is there, are there any elements to that? Like a golf swing? I think there are. I think the only difference is like when you're swinging a golf club, like you don't have, 300 pound people running at you so (laughs) um (laughs) so you can like if you if you're looking to make a a substantial change in your motion your processes on the football like you have to rep that hundreds and hundreds of times outside of a competitive performance focused environment so that it then shows up when you get to that environment so i think you get something you can be conscious of in the offseason in training and stuff like that but like once you're 
on the field and playing, like you're just going to play. You're not going to think about that in the moment. So if you're going to make a substantial substantial change like that, like it's definitely something that has to be repped and repped and repped. Okay. We can wrap it up here with one question from one of our message board posters on the Peristyle. Trojan777 Miller wants to know, in today's transfer portal world, even though you did choose to stuck around, stick around, was there ever any temptation to at least explore the portal? Um, I don't think there was necessarily a temptation to go in the portal. I think there was definitely frustration in in sitting on the sideline for a few years. That was That was definitely difficult, but I don't think – there was ever a time where I was like leaving and going in the portal would be better for me than staying here and developing and waiting for my shot. Um, so frustration, yes, but temptation to leave, no. Yeah, Connor, you want to do a couple of quick ones for the Peristyle? We'll let you, we'll, like two more minutes. Miller, is that cool? Are you good? Yeah, no, okay. whatever you guys need. Do you have any other ones up from the Peristyle pulled out? We do have a few other ones, so okay. sure. <laughs> USC Rocks wants to know, which current or former NFL quarterback do you model your game after and why? Um, I mean, in, in watching NFL tape, there's two guys that I kind of study the most. Um, it'd be Stafford and, and Burrow. I think their ability to play the game the right way, to play on time, to know where their, their throwaways are, to not take negative plays really sets them apart. I think Brady was great at that, obviously, but he's unfortunately no longer around. But, um, but um, yeah, those two guys really stick out. I think they play the game the right way. Um, like I said, they they know where their outlets are at all times to avoid negative plays, and I think I I can obviously got a ways to go, but somewhat see myself playing in in a similar manner. So those are two guys I, I really look up to. Another one from USC Rocks. What area of your game do you want to improve the most this off season? What are you working on specifically? Yeah, I mean I think the the best way to answer that is is everything. Um, <laughs> you can <laughs> you can always um, even if you're like, just because you are strong in a certain area doesn't mean you should then not work on it. You know, like, your strengths are your strengths for a reason. Um, so I obviously want to improve my strengths and eliminate my weaknesses. So without giving too much away, that's where I'll leave. <laughs> nice. I, I like it. And then we can wrap up here. 619 Grizzly wants to know, aside from yourself, and then you mentioned Easton and Achilles too, who on offense and defense has stepped up as a leader this offseason? Anyone else outside of you three? Yeah, uh, great question. I think Jonah Monheim for that that O line group. He's kind of become the veteran in that room, um, and then Kyron Hudson in the the receiver room. They oh. both kind of ended into roles of of leadership in their rooms with younger guys around them. Uh, and then in the DB room, I would say Jalen Smith and and Bryson Shaw have have stepped into leadership roles. Um, Jalen Smith, in particularly, obviously. Um, someone who's not always comfortable speaking up in a leadership role, but someone who has played himself into the right to speak. So he's done a great job kind of coming out of his shell and, and being uncom being comfortable, being uncomfortable and stepping into that leadership role that we as a team need him to to inhabit. So super happy for him and obviously always welcoming more leadership on the team. Yeah, well, I mean, you obviously, you know, very close to him through high school and everything. Uh, I We interviewed him. I interviewed him in person on campus last year for one of these series, and he was great, like just um, just all, all kinds of personality. So was he kind of oh, yeah. someone in that – it was in his shell a little bit, and he's come out a lot more now? Yeah, definitely. I mean, like, I don't think he's ever been in his shell, like, personally, but as a leader, <laughs> oh, okay. I should say. Yeah. Um, but like you said, phenomenal guy, someone – like that I've loved being around since I was 13, 14 years old. So great, great dude, but really happy for him and proud of him to see kind of the role he's starting to take in, in this team. All right. Well, we want to like, thank you. Miller Moss killing it. Uh, great job. Follow him on Twitter at Miller Moss seven. Do you do Instagram more or what's your favorite like social media thing? Or if you do any of them? Yeah, I'm on, I'm on Instagram. I try to stay off Twitter. Okay. <laughs> Probably. Yeah. Just, we, yeah. Um, but yeah, um, I'm on it occasionally, but definitely more Instagram. Okay. Well, you, you got to go follow them because it kind of helps NIL deals and stuff. The more followers you get and everything. So get on there and help them. But we really appreciate you coming on. Uh, thanks so much and best of luck, you know, getting through these uh, early practices in the spring. And of course, going into uh, 2024 and big and being a Big Ten play. So thanks again for coming on, Miller. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, guys. All right. Uh, we're going to take a little quick break and we'll come back. Thanks again to Miller Moss. We'll be back in a minute, everybody.
All righty. We are back here on the Parastel Podcast. Uh, we got Connor. We got me. Miller's gone. That's okay. We, you know, we, we had a lot of his time. So I thought that was, uh, it was good, but I thought it was a good interview. He's definitely someone that is going to represent the university. Well, uh, his performance in the holiday bowl looks like he can play football. So it seems like USC's, uh, in a pretty good spot as far as, uh, you know, leadership and quarterback play kind of going forward. But I really like that one. I don't know. What'd you think? Yeah. Loved it. You didn't tell me that the super chat was for 50 bucks though. I know. It was I thought it was for like two bucks, 50 bucks. Thanks, Alex. We had to, yeah. Thank you, Alex. Um, but I mean, I didn't want to like, we're, we're trying to get you to donate to house of victory. You know, we're, you know, <laughs> we can't, uh, we're not, you know, we're not part of that. We're not part of the recruiting process and all that stuff, but you know, we, you know, we have, uh, you know, we can promote, uh, the house of victory and by having uh, players and stuff come on our show. So we wanted to kind of do that. So kind of wanted to focus on that, but that was cool. That was good stuff. I mean, he's, yeah, I mean, he's, he's someone that's easy to root for, obviously. Certainly people will say I focus on the negative too much and I probably do. I thought it was interesting. He said the skill position guys last year, a little selfish. We haven't really heard much of that. And it makes sense when you have the maths exodus from the receiver room that USC did. I think there were some unhappy campers in that room. And we saw what happened in the holiday bowl with the younger guys getting their chance and, and Miller getting his chance. And it just seems like that group really came together well. And now you add some transfers and some early and early freshmen a guy like Elijah newbies bought in it. I think I don't know from a talent perspective how much better USC will be this upcoming season, but I think they have a lot of the intangibles or they should have a lot of the intangibles that last year's team maybe didn't have. So I, I think that's really significant. And with Miller leading the way, he's a guy who waited his turn. Yeah. And I think people really respect that, especially in this era where if you don't play as a highly ranked quarterback, you're 99% chance you're gone. And he is one of the rare, rare exceptions. So I think he has a lot of credibility without even playing that much, which is big and that'll trickle down. So the team is a lot more likable heading into next season. And I think that's significant because last year for a lot of those games, especially at the end, it was frustrating. And I think maybe some players it's, it's college football. So you don't want to say that the team was unlikable, but I, I think this team will be a lot more likable and the fans can get behind him more. Yeah. And it's weird. Cause like Caleb Williams was the face of the team and, and some people are trying to make him unlikable because everyone, you know, he was going to be the number one pick of the draft, but I don't think he would have been part of that. There was just other reasons. Right. Yeah. I mean, it was, you would think it's, Oh, it was good. I don't think Caleb will like, like I mentioned, I put that picture up. If you're watching uh, live on YouTube uh, earlier, I mean the, the embrace that Caleb Williams and Miller Moss had, like he literally was, so excited for Miller Moss and it's like, okay, you know, and when we asked Miller about it, like same thing, like you could tell, like that's, that was legit. So, uh, but yeah, I think this is a team that a lot of people can really, you know, are, are going to like, and uh, you know, we'll see, they'll probably add some guys in the portal. Uh, we'll see how kind of spring develops, but with the new coaches, it just seems like it's, it's, there's a different feel here. Um, we didn't really get to do the, the beginning of the show because this podcast, but we wanted to get right to Miller, but yeah, getting him for 40 minutes was great. So thanks to Miller for coming on and sharing some time and house of victory too. Uh, if you want to send us any questions for the show, especially through spring football podcast at uscfootball.com is the email address. Let us know which show you're talking about. And if you want to leave us a voicemail or send us a text, you can do that too. 424-254-9141. And you know, you can subscribe on Apple podcasts. Spotify is getting really popular right now for a lot of podcasting. You can leave us a a rating there and on Apple podcasts, you can leave us a review. We appreciate those. We did get a new one from EMG Trojans one. He said, personal podcast in Georgia. I just want to say thank you to your team for providing all the different content on USC football, living here in GA it's sec country for sure. But being a California native, I can follow the Trojans on a weekly basis throughout the year. It's much appreciated. Cheers to you guys and fight on. Uh, Eric Garcia sent that. Um, I play beach volleyball with an Eric Garcia, but not him. He's not in Georgia, but thank you for the review. Appreciate that. Um, and, uh, yeah, like I said, those help grow the show if you want to do that. So cool stuff. Very, very kind review. Should we get into some of these NIL developments, Ryan? I saw on YouTube, someone wants us to talk about that and I don't blame them. What a, what a big day today's been in the NIL space. I know I'm not the host though. I'm kind of stealing your, no, you, 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 uh, you drive the boat. No host away. So, uh, <laughs> We, um, Spencer uh, Harris from House of Victory, the exec executive director over there, helps set up these interviews. He did post on the Peristyle a little bit earlier today before we went 
live with a really interesting update on USC's NIL situation. And if you've heard, you know, Lincoln Riley made some uh, really interesting comments about how far this NIL program has come. If you're not a Parastyle member over at uscfootball.com, you can do it right now until the end of the day tomorrow for 50% off. So make sure you go check it out. But you're going to get stuff like this, these NIL updates. Uh, the insider information is on our site 24-7, you know, all the time. Not just the name of our site, but it's always over on there. But uh, Spencer came on and posted an exclusive update on the Parastyle about uh, where USC is with NIL and House of Victory. So if you want to kind of summarize that, uh, Connor, that'd be good. Sure. He said the 2024 budget is much bigger than 2023, but the biggest thing, I'll just read the first two sentences. Tennessee going after the NCAA changed everything. House of Victory can now have open discussions with recruits and support them with NIL opportunities before they enroll at USC. If you're a USC fan hearing that, you're thinking, hallelujah, <laughs> finally, we can do what other teams are likely or were likely doing in the past. And that lawsuit really changed everything. USC now is a big time player in the NIL space because they have the funds, but also because let's tell it like it is. They're paying the high school recruits, what everyone wanted. <laughs> a massive, massive deal hearing that from, from Spencer today. USC now, they, there's no excuse for them not to have a, a top 10 class. And I think they can even have a top five class between the defensive staff and then Lincoln Riley, what he does on offense. And now this NIL setup. I think USC is in the game now, and they weren't in the game until these last couple of weeks. It's a massive, massive deal. Yeah, I was talking to some people that work at USC and just the changes that have been made. And it, and some of it is, you know, the, the philosophy. And I, I, I reached out to all of them after that lawsuit happened with Tennessee, and they were just still trying to feel it out. So, But now it seems like they're like, okay, there's pretty much no more rules. And it's not necessarily even like paying high school players like that, that can be involved, but it's USC wasn't engaging with a prospect about NIL opportunities. They were waiting until they were enrolled and like house of victory wasn't going to be involved. Now they have a special wing and, and, and Spencer put a link on it where you can donate to funds to, you know, for high school prospects and, um, that is a game changer. And, you know, there were schools like Oregon and, and Tennessee and Texas A&M that were definitely involved in that. You know, Tennessee was getting in trouble. Like those schools were getting in trouble by the NCAA. And then the court said, no, you're not getting in trouble for that. You can't limit. Basically, you know, it's, it's these are like employment laws. And that's why, you know, the, the sport's changing and they're probably going to be employees at some point. Or at least the university will be, you know, paying these players at some point. But it sort of took the shackles off USC and other schools that were following kind of the letter of the law from the NCAA and said, we don't want to get in trouble. Other schools were like, you can't enforce this. We're going to do it anyway. So now USC is at least on the same playing field. Plus it's been, you know, last year they were really were ramping up house of victory. Uh, and now they're like, you know, kind of full swing. They've added staff and they've, I think they've got gained more trust from a lot of the bigger donors and they're taking part and, We've heard donations have gone up. Um, you know, the, the engagement has gone up. They're more involved in the recruiting process. And I don't think it's a coincidence that USC's had its biggest recruiting weekend in years uh, just over the weekend after this was kind of going on. So the combination of like, you still need to do the USC stuff, like the the selling the Heismans, the being in Los Angeles. The defensive the, staff. Yeah, the defensive, like having great recruiters, defensive staff, guys like Eric Henderson. But if Eric Henderson didn't have NIL opportunities, as good as he is, and you have Aaron Donald on campus, you can't, that's the way USC recruited before. NIL is a huge part of it now. Like now, like you can use all those advantages USC has in recruiting because you have good NIL to go with it. So when you had kind of crappy NIL, all those advantages, you might get some kids, but you're going to lose a bunch. And now you're going to be in on those guys. And we saw the kind of you know results uh, this weekend. It was just crazy. Uh, having great recruiters, having so much to sell. And also you're not behind as far as like, basically someone's not taking a pay cut. Like, I think Alabama's learning this lesson. Like, you would go to Alabama because Nick Saban, they would take the Nick Saban discount. Because you're like, you know what? It's Nick Saban. So it doesn't matter if they, they pay as well as Texas A&M does. Now you're not getting that discount anymore. So now Alabama has to be competitive in that market. I think USC is now competitive in that market, 
So you're more in the even playing field and you have a lot of advantages that other schools don't. So they can get back to, like Connor said, getting the top 10, top five classes again. Massive, massive difference. And one thing that I think is really important too, NIL is huge, but you also now have a defensive staff where we need to see it on the field, of course, but it's going to be different for sure. And I was the one who said Alex Grinch's defense will be better in the second year at USC. So I, I get it if you don't want to believe me, but <laughs> this staff, I just feel like is so much more competent and having Eric Henderson be able to bring in Aaron Donald and just the way he recruits, it, it's different. And we've been telling you that for a while, especially on the recruiting front. I, I do think the defense will be a lot better. And that needs to be talked about too. The NIL stuff I think is the most important part of all this, but if they had the same defensive staff as last year with this new NIL stuff, would they have gotten the recruits that they did over the weekend? I don't believe so. So there were sort of two missing pieces, and Lincoln Riley addressed that after practice Tuesday. I wrote about it, how it's the collectives and the defensive staff, and, and that's been a good combination. One other thing i got to get off my chest. Oh, go ahead. I've been talking about NIL for a while and how USC, I felt like they could be doing more. It's great to see that they are doing more. But I heard from a lot of USC fans who would tell me, hey – we don't want those NIL guys. They're not good for our culture. We don't want people getting paid in high school. That's that's not what we're about. And crickets from those people since <laughs> Spencer Harris came out and said we can now get involved with high school recruits. You just need to be on the cutting edge. You need to be doing stuff that might seem kind of, is this the right thing to do? Should we really be getting involved with high school recruits? If other teams and some of these powerful teams are doing it, like in Ohio State, like in Texas, you're going to get left behind. And I believe – even though I like a lot of what USC did with their last recruiting class, there's a reason they're outside the top 10, outside the top 15. It's because of this, because they weren't doing what other schools were doing. Now they are, the playing field's level. They're on the cutting edge with a lot of these other teams. And when you have the money that USC has, they're not only on the cutting edge, but they can start being trendsetters. And they can really take this to another level, I believe. I think they can go crazy here and and, and really explode. I, I, I firmly believe that with this new... NIL set up. So thank you to the schools that, that sued. Thank you, Tennessee. And was it, it was, North, was it, it was in Virginia too, oh, but Virginia, I, I, think I think it was yeah. North Carolina, maybe sued in a Virginia court or something. I don't think Virginia, the school sued, but this has really changed everything. And now that the playing field is level with these other elite recruiting teams and these other elite football programs, I'm really excited to see what USC has up its sleeve because I think weekends like this can continue based on, the playing field being level. Yeah. And I think now that you are competitive, like, so when money's involved, it's, you know, it changes the game. You're now competitive. I don't, USC is probably not going to be outbidding a lot, you know, like Tennessee or somebody, or maybe even like Oregon for a player. But if you're competitive and you want to go to USC over Oregon, I think that's where before it was like, you weren't even competitive. So it's like, I I'm going to just They weren't go. competitive with Oregon. And I, I wrote right. about it at signing day. They, they had maybe one or two guys who Oregon also liked, but let's be honest, if Oregon really wanted them, they probably would have gotten those guys too. The list goes on and on. I, I, I wrote about it. I recommend people check that out. I think that's changed now. Right. Will USC get everyone? No, but they will be a hell of a lot more competitive than they were. That's a guarantee. Yeah. So you're competitive with those guys, but say, you know, Phil Knight's still going to like, we're going to overpay for this guy. And I think USC will probably be smart, you know, with, the funds they they actually have funds now and will they go all in overpay for some guy that some other school might get yeah probably not and maybe you, you might lose some guys that way but it's not the the philosophy of paying a high school player it's just how much do you want to and like i think now usc can be competitive with those guys they're not gonna lose anyone that cares about money at all they're not gonna lose them but you might not get the guy that was just i'm going the highest bidder no matter what i'll go to you know creighton or uh, Fairmont Community College as long as they pay the most. They don't care. Like You probably lose those guys. And maybe those are the kind of guys that the, the the message board guys that you were talking about didn't want. And if that's all they care about is is getting the most money, then you know maybe that's not the right person for your program. That, that totally makes sense. But now you're at least competitive with the other teams that are trying to recruit the same guys. And uh, it just it, it's going to make it a much more level playing field. And you can get a top defensive lineman from the state of Georgia who was committed to Georgia to flip to USC because you have similar funds. And also there's LA and Aaron Donald and all this other stuff going on that, that you can sell. But before you couldn't sell that stuff because 
you didn't have the money to kind of back it up. You know, you have the money to back it up. You can use all those other advantages to try to recruit. Without these changes, too, there is a 0% chance USC would have held on to Julian Lewis, and not because he's an NIL guy, but because he wants an NIL setup that allows a school to build a class around him. Yes. And, of course, he's an NIL guy to some degree as well, but I mean that in the sense that he's not the highest bidder kind of guy. He just wants the best chance to win. And USC, with what they're doing now, they're going to be able to put him in one of the best chances to win compared to every other school in college football. It's just a drastic, drastic change. Better late than never. I understand USC being risk-averse with some of the stuff that's happened in the past and not wanting to middle finger the NCAA just based on some prior transgressions. That's done now, and I'm excited to see what the future holds because I got a text after Eric Henderson landed all these guys last weekend that said he's not done. They're going to get some more guys on the defensive line and expect him to – continue to roll. I got another text. I said Sunday, Julian Lewis's dad was really, really impressed with what USC was able to do last weekend, which is huge because now he's going to visit USC this weekend. He has a bunch of stuff planned out, some NIL, some stuff at USC. It's just great that the NIL people can now work with him and talk with him yes. and say, it's one thing if the coach says, oh, this is probably the price range and these companies can work with you. But now an NIL person can say, no, here's the plan. This is what we have for you. And it's just different than it was. It's a massive, massive difference. That's the the th words I keep going back to. USC's in the game now. It's great. Yeah. Basically, before House of Victory did not get in, wouldn't have been involved in this big recruiting weekend. They wouldn't have been giving a presentation or talk like now. They can be now. It's it's more integrated, um, and it's eventually going to be part of the universities. Like it's basically going to be universities going to start paying directly. That's going to happen. I don't know. It could be in the next year, it could be the next five years, but it's going to be that way soon enough. And I think USC set up pretty well because House of Victory could just go from like, you know, kind of an affiliated thing to in-house and that probably wouldn't be much of an issue at all. Um, but it's going to get there. But now, before they were pretty separate because they weren't really involved on those recruiting weekends. They weren't involved in that stuff where they would be at other schools. Now they are. And I think it shows you're taking it more seriously and a guy like uh, Julian Lewis sees what happens on this weekend. They're like, okay, I'm not going to be there by myself. There's going to be some really great players coming in as well because they're taking this more seriously. So this is a big step. And I think, you know, is it going to show results in 2024? Probably not. But, I mean, the, the next couple of years, like, you're going to see it, you're getting those kind of guys on campus. And we'll see how this recruiting class pans out and if these guys all stay and all that kind of stuff. But it's it's – it's a game changer for USC just where they were. Like it was going to be tough to do this in the portal every year. Um, but if you can build the high school through the high school ranks, like Lincoln Riley said he wants to do, you, that's kind of more for long-term success, I think, on the football side. So uh, we'll see where they go with it. But it's, it's, it's a game changer for sure. And that's why I think Lincoln Riley has been in such a good mood these past couple of weeks. He, I don't know if, if you've felt that way, Ryan, but at practice, he's smiley. He, he's happy. He, <laughs> at 5.30 the other morning, he – gave us a big smile and at the women's basketball game talking to Jen Cohen the night before he he seemed happy and I thought one really interesting part of Tuesday he said the NIL stuff outside of the collectives last year was really good but the collectives were just okay and he says that on the record something that I've been saying for a really long yeah. time they just weren't and it wasn't it's not Spencer's fault it was higher ups directing him what to do so people think I have beef with Spencer. No, I, I, I do not. Why do you hate Spencer? What happened? <laughs> I, I like Spencer <laughs> a lot. What I, what I'm trying to say is Lincoln Riley pretty much put on the record what we all thought all along. And it was nice to get some clarity on that. The, the collective last year, because of stuff outside of his control, outside of Spencer's control, wasn't as good as some of these other schools. And now it is based on new rules and based on more donors. I, I've heard USC's gotten some massive support recently, which keep saying massive has gotten some big time support recently, which has been significant. Yeah, for sure. Um, we got some questions in the chat. If you do have a question in the chat, uh, if you're watching live on YouTube, thanks very much. We got a lot of people stuck around after uh, Miller left, but um, if you're still watching in the chat and you have a question, you can put that up there. We want to mention uh, Andy Enfield as well. Oh yeah. Um, what was it? What night was it? Was it Monday night? What, when did I text you guys? You was heard it? before anyone. It was. Might've been. Was it Sunday uh, night? Maybe I think it was Monday. It was maybe I was, was at the women's game. Maybe it was Monday night, and I get a text, and it's like Andy Edfield's looking at um, 
SMU. And I was like, oh, okay. That seems a little different. I know because a lot of fans after the disappointing season uh, were kind of all over Enfield and wanted them fired. A lot of, I'm not everybody, but a lot of fans did. You know, we had reached out, I think Connor and I both, to people that we know around the program. And not, not, we got zero indication that that was going to happen. And it was quite the opposite, that Enfield was coming back. And we, you know, let you guys know, I think probably put in the war room um, uh, over at uscfootball.com if you want to check that out. So this was a, a different development. Um, if, I think, I mean, if there was no cost involved, I don't know, but people in the athletic department probably would have explored going in another direction for the basketball team, but it just made sense, I think, for them with everything involved to bring him back. But if he leaves on his own and USC gets, you know, an eight-figure payout for a buyout and they get to find a new coach. I think it might make for a tough first year in the Big Ten, um, but, you know, it might be a clean slate, you know, kind of for everybody. So it's, we've heard that it's very likely happening. It's not, I don't think it's been signed yet. There's been some reports out there. It seems uh, very likely. At this point, it's kind of one of those things where, you know, what it, you know, you're, you're talking about it it would be hard to come back at this point. Right. But um, yeah. So it looks like most likely Andy Enfield is heading to um, SMU and you'll see USC will have a, a coaching search for a men's basketball coach and uh, kind of rebuild the program a little bit, but any kind of thoughts on everything that's been going on, Connor? I do think he's gone, even if it isn't official yet, the reports out there that he's expected to leave next week officially and I kind of feel like even if something were to fall through, it's very challenging to come back from the week that the USC men's basketball program has had where it's not just reporters being shut out. Coaches of recruits are reaching out saying, hey, can you give us some clarity what's happening? And people are just in the dark completely. So anything's possible. Could he, in theory, come back and they have a good season if they recruit in the portal? Fine. I, I guess that's possible, but I, I just think what's happened this week with stuff trickling out on Monday, like you heard, Ryan, and now here we are Wednesday night and people are reporting he's expected to be gone. It, it, it's just a lot's happened. And if he does leave, USC, I believe, will hire someone quickly because the portal's open. And then maybe they're already looking now, I'm sure they are, with him likely to be gone. So we have all our stuff ready. We, I have got a list of hot board candidates ready. I, I don't want to post that until he's officially gone. But at this point in time, I would be shocked if he returned based on everything I've heard. Yeah, I mean, I, I talked to someone in the athletic department earlier today, and he has not resigned as of yet. I think you had heard the same. Uh -huh. um, but I think that's where we're likely going. Uh, so, you know, we'll see. We'll kind of keep you up to date on what's going on with that. But, yeah. But it might, I mean, I think a lot of USC fans wouldn't be all that upset if that happened. Um, yeah, it's one of those things. It's kind of like the Florida State and Clemson suing the ACC to get out. I mean, even if you, like, you got to figure out a way to be done with this relationship. It's just sort of like you're filing for divorce. And you're like, nah, I'm going to, I'm fine. I don't want to be divorced anymore. I mean, that's, it, it just seems like that's, that sours the relationship. If he's this close to taking a job, I think it makes it almost impossible to come back. Cause then it's like, there's no trust there. It just seems kind of the weird ones. It's kind of a weird one. So I uh, will probably should know something really soon, but you know, like we said, it seems very likely, but not like official official. And it's too bad for USC that it probably won't happen until next week because they'll be at a disadvantage recruiting the portal, even though they maybe could do some stuff behind the scenes to overcome that a little bit. But the financial piece of it. You can't fire Andy Enfield because his contract is guaranteed through whenever his extension was signed, I, I, late this decade. So he has a lot of years left is what I'm trying to say. And if yeah. you fire him, then you got to pay him a lot. And if he leaves on his own, then you don't. And that is significant. So the recruiting timeline kind of stinks. If he doesn't leave until right. next week, you're at a big disadvantage in the portal, but you save a lot of money, and that's probably more important in the, in the long term. I think we got a couple questions in the chat and we'll uh, end this one. Uh, what player are you most excited to see and who really looks like a dude? What player am I most excited to see? That's a great question. I wish we could see more. Yeah, We can't really see much. So that's a hard one to answer because we don't see a whole lot. 
Um, I think on offense, Woody Marks. Yeah, he would be up there. Jumps out to me. He spoke to us on Tuesday. Uh, kind of quiet kid, but just. You could tell, like, you just get the feeling like, all right, this guy's going to play. <laughs> you know? Oh, he has to play. <laughs> Without him, they're in trouble at running back. So I'm excited to see what he looks like. And I, I imagine he's going to get a ton of touches. And I think he's better as a pass catcher than Marshawn Lloyd is, so or was, so he can do some more things for that offense, kind of like a Swiss Army knife. So I'd say I'm probably the most excited for him. And then what was the other question? Oh, uh, who looks like a dude? Elijah Newby looks like a dude. He's solidified he himself taking number two reps alongside Rajon Davis based on some of the linebacker stuff we've seen. It was great to hear Miller Moss talk about how he's really bought in. I don't know if playing time, not on special teams, will, will happen with him much unless there's an injury or he really, really impresses. But I, I think USC got a really good player. And there's a reason his recruiting ranking every time the new updates came out would go up and up and up. He, he's someone who it's not just Miller Moss, it's not just us talking about him. It's it's sort of very apparent that uh, he, he's just getting better each and every day. They want to know um, who's taking like Taka Curtis's reps too. So Newby would be one of those guys, right, in the practice? Yeah, so what, what we can see, it has nothing to do with 11-on-11 11 11 football, but when they're doing their own separate linebacker drills, it's been Mason Cobb and Easton Mascarenas Arnold taking the first reps, and then Rajon Davis and... Newby taking the second reps and then Eric Gentry behind them. But I've said this on instant and I've said this uh, on the peristyle written it, Eric Gentry being sort of behind the scenes. That's just kind of what he does. He yeah. comes out last to practice a lot. He isn't the guy who jumps in line to be first to do a rep. He, he's just kind of more reserved. And yeah. I don't want to paint him in a bad light. He, he's a good player. He just is kind of a different type of cat. And I, I think, a Cobb and an Easton Mascarenas aren't like those guys are like, all right, I'm going to be first. I'm the leader in your face. Eric's just a little bit different. He's the guy the coaching staff has talked the most about when we've spoken with them in the off season. So it's not like he, he's doing anything wrong right now. He, he's just different than those other two guys. And I yeah. do expect him to play a lot. Jacoby Lane is one. Yeah. Um, I want to see more of him. I mean, just the young receivers from the holiday bowl. Uh, looked really good. Uh, probably the least heralded of all those guys. They're Deuce Robinson, Makai Lemon. Um, I'm excited for Makai. Yeah, Makai, like he, you know, he he showed some flashes in that game too. And then, you know, you know, Zachariah Branch was sort of like the afterthought in the Holiday Bowl. But those, you know, those three guys were studs. So I think seeing that room and him mentioning like Kyron Hudson, who we got to talk to. Uh, the other day as well, you know, being one of the leaders. So it's it's not as deep of a receiver room, but I mean, it's I think there's some real talent in there, and they're probably they're going to add somebody from the portal as well. But um, seems like pretty good chemistry right now, and uh, and some really good talent there, and some young some young talent. I do think there will be one or two home run portal additions this second window. I don't know who, I don't know what position, but I think they're going to hit on a couple of guys who okay like I've heard of that guy and he is a real player guys who I don't want to say they didn't hit in the first window but like a Jordan Addison or like a Barry Alexander someone who people will really know and has a lot of talent we uh we'll do one last one only natties at USC Howie how is Amos T looking offensive line is suspect this year we need him to hold down the right guard spot he's been taking some right guard reps so that um, is a good development for him, but I think Chris had something in the uh, peristyle about how Isaiah Rakes beat him up in one drill. He's just young, so I don't know. Their offensive line needs a lot of help. To me, this, it'll be the talk of the offseason. How good the offensive line is will determine how good the team is, in my opinion, because I think there are some major holes there, and they, they need help. Both tackles are very inexperienced and you need a right guard. So three out of five spots are sort of up in the air. And then Jonah at center, Emmanuel Pregnon at left guard. Those people are reliable, I, I think. And Jonah's switching positions. Last year we saw some guys switch positions who were, were reliable in the past, and then it didn't work out. So maybe it, I'm mistaken to put him in the automatically going to be good stack, but I do think he'll be good. He's the best offensive lineman on the team, even if uh, he is playing center. So 
that's where I'm really nervous about, and we'll see. I think Josh Henson and Lincoln Riley behind closed doors are nervous about it too. Yeah, I think when we asked Henson about it, yes, is it yesterday? Yeah, yesterday at practice. It was so early. It was like it seemed like two days ago. But um, I mean, the first thing he mentioned with Monheim was just how I mean how smart he is, and it's just it's one of those things that you you rely on that center to do a lot. And I think the stuff you would, that Henson might worry about with a center, if they're not getting the calls right or not making the right, you know, I don't think he feels that way with Monheim. So at least you're starting off in a really good spot and we'll see, you know, if you're someone playing out in left tackle, like you can know what to do, but doing it can be a whole different story. Um, so as long as the snaps are good, I think, you know, we know he can block, but just making all those calls and doing, you know, getting all that stuff right setting, you know, get everyone on the same page, getting those five guys to be, you know, they always say it's like five fingers on a hand. They all have to kind of work together. That's his job. And it seems like Henson was pretty confident he could do that. Uh, so at least you're, you got that going. And, you know, probably the hardest part, you feel pretty confident he could do. I saw a question on the YouTube about freshmen on the two deep. If the season started tomorrow, Elijah Page, redshirt freshman, left tackle, either Amos or Alani Noah at right guard to, well, Noah is actually a sophomore, but uh, Amos is a redshirt freshman. And then at right tackle, if it's not Mason Murphy, who is more experienced, it would be Tobias Raymond, who's another redshirt freshman. Freshman, So there certainly would be some guys on the two deep. We'll see what they do in the portal. But yeah. even with those additions, Elijah Page is going to be on the two deep no matter what. Yeah. And then we'll see with those other guys. All righty. Um, well, I think that can wrap things up. Uh, where do we go? Yeah, hour and, hour and 11 minutes or hour and 12 minutes. Um, great stuff. Uh, from Miller Moss again. Thanks to uh, House of Victory for putting that together. We haven't had a uh, a player on for a while, so it's good um, to get them back. Get to talk. We didn't get to talk to Miller this week, so it's good to get a little catch up with him and see how things are were going. And I want to thank House of Victory, thank Trader Joe's, our longtime sponsor, and you know, of course, Connor for coming in. He's just been killing it. Oh. He does every show. He wants you know all the instant analysis. He's out all the basketball stuff. Just killing it, Connor. You're ready. You just you never say no. I love it. <laughs> Thank you for the kind words, Ryan. I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, but if you guys haven't uh, checked out the site, Connor's putting a lot of great content up. RJ, Chris, Gerard, Shotgun, everybody. You know, Ahmad's been killing the women's basketball coverage. Um, so much good stuff going up there over at uscfootball.com. So make sure you check it out. Uh, you know, our podcast feed, you'll love that. Parastyle Podcast. And of course, our uh, YouTube channel at Inside Troy. A lot of great stuff going up there. Tons of videos go up from every practice. And of course, we do these live ones as well. Uh, the podcasts and the video shows and all of that. So uh, for Connor Morissette, Mr. Triple Double himself, I am Ryan Abraham. Hope you guys enjoyed the show. And we will talk to you next time.